talking of which, uh, just so that I can get a couple of different perspectives um, on the things that we're talking about today, I asked Hannah and Sagan if they'd join us. Um, so uh, we're very, very lucky to have them sitting in. Most of the time, uh, it turns out that everybody sent in like millions of questions, which is brilliant. Um, so I have got a list uh, so that we can go through them, use our time wisely, but at various moments, I'll try and um, bring in Hannah or Sagan so that we can uh, uh, get another perspective on, on that. Um, so that's all the housekeeping. Uh, first subject for today um, is uh, COVID-19. So um, basically there's, uh, I, my, my take on what's happening at the moment, and obviously I'm no expert on the, on the science or the medicine, but even over the last few days, I think there's been a fundamental shift in uh, how our work as composers, particularly media composers, is going to function over the next few months. And I think that has going to have a lot of consequences um, financially for, for a lot of people. Um, also in terms of our mental health and how we all uh, relate to each other and work with each other. Um, one of the reasons for putting the uh, putting a poll up, and uh, and we can see down there that sort of roughly kind of a third, a third, a third. I'm in the not yet, but things are looking shaky department myself. I've got two shows running right now, uh, the fourth season of Unforgotten, and an, then a new ten part BBC drama. Um, Unforgotten's filming right now, and. Uh, who knows? Uh, Line of Duty's just been put on hiatus today. I saw there's a piece in the Guardian if you if you want to search for that. Um, and then also, I, th I think there was another another big show. Pretty much everybody that I know is saying that productions are stopping right now. Uh, and then a show that hasn't started, I think, will um, uh, almost certainly not going to not going to shoot in because it can't be insured. Now, um, being sort of uh, realistic about what the what this means at different stages of your career one of the aspects of being uh very old like a dinosaur is that it's easier to absorb work changing um because there's a royalty stream from from previous years but if this is your uh, uh if you're either mid-career or if you're earlier on your career this is going to be really um really difficult to uh uh, to absorb I think not just in terms of cancellation but in terms of um, how how it feels uh, in terms of your career development uh, maybe I could just uh, bring in uh, Sagan see if you'd got a, uh, a, a comment on that I've, have you heard anything uh, in your uh, in your neck of the woods uh, not yet but um... I am waiting to be updated about something. So I'm in the middle of something at the moment, which I, I suspect has to be in some way affected because they're meant to be flying to South Africa to do some filming. Um, and I'm, I haven't quite checked up on whether South Africa has stopped allowing flights from the UK to um, come in. But I assume that if they haven't, they probably will soon because yeah. most, <laughs> most countries are kind, of, um, are kind of stopping them. So... I guess for me that that's the first point of realizing well it, it may not directly affect me in terms of i'm i'm sat here and i'm kind of writing away yeah. but eventually it will it has to because something's going to happen to the production whether it's a pause or whether it's um yeah why or whether they choose to, to shoot somewhere else or try and do it here but then even in that regard so many productions are stopping and pausing that it seems inevitable that um, something will probably happen and yeah. we'll have to hold back for a little bit of time. I hear you. Hannah, you're on something right now and you're saying that they're uh, trying to uh, get it across the finish line in post-production? Yeah, so it's um, it was currently, well, it was shot in Northern Ireland and the post is happening here, but the final mixes with every with the execs and the director, everybody coming has been postponed. So the actual sign off of things isn't happening very quickly, but at least, you know, most of it has been done in the actual, um, most of the writing work. So I'm on my final week. I, 
film the final episode. I record the final episode on Monday and then, and hopefully that will go ahead. But over here, it just seems to be a little bit lighter than what everyone's dealing with in London and various other cities at the moment. Yeah. It's, I'm a, more and more a town place than... <laughs> 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 um, so nobody's walking around with masks yet. Our toilet rolls are still for sale. But um... can, oh, well, we should all fly <laughs> over and buy your toilet rolls instead. <laughs> not, not in North London right now. But I think the, the worry here is because it's the UK, um, is the flight situation. Like people from London aren't able to come here to to shoot as, as frequently or finish shows and things, which, you know, the industry here relies on quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, th I think in, in summary, the, um, uh, the seriousness of the change, the preparedness of the change and, and today sort of, uh, just not touching on the, on the incredibly serious health issues, but just, as, as composers all together, um, looking at uh, how we need to prepare ourselves. Um, I, we were talking here and, and I wonder whether this situation is gonna precipitate a uh, fundamental rethink in the, in the way that we communicate with each other digitally uh, and online, because uh, one of the things that I've always advocated in terms of making the relationships that are absolutely key to um, to building a career is face-to-face um, -face communication and making friends and being uh, in a room with someone so that you can become a, tr a true collaborator with them. And as that opportunity is, is very quickly disappearing from us, it, it may well be that we can finish work that is, is close to the edge, like, perhaps Hannah's project, maybe Segan's too. But on the other hand, I think starting projects and meeting new um, new people, new directors, new filmmakers, I think is going to become increasingly difficult. And and one of the, maybe we can split this into, into two aspects. One is um, the technology and, and how we actually sort of physically reach out to people. But also, I think fundamentally, um, the skills that we might have learned to be good communicators, which uh, every great film or TV composer that I know is a good personal communicator. That, that's so much part of the job that we're having to rethink this and retool this uh, in a digital age. It, in a way, I, I was thinking about it in terms of sort of digital empathy. How is it? What do we need to do? What, how do we need to uh, transform the way that we communicate in order to to increase the amount of um, empathetic personal connection that we have with the people that we work with or the people that we'd hope to work with, so I'll uh, let you uh, I'll let you think about that while we go into some of the some of the questions. Uh, just in terms of your time, uh, I was going to try and do a, a relatively neat hour. Um, we'll see we'll see how that goes. There are many more questions, um, so. I thought I'd respond to, and uh, forgive me, there was a few last minute entries. Um, so I'll do some paper shuffling. Uh, some of the questions that we'd had. Um, first of all, actually, um, just just before I started, I, I was uh, slightly um, surprised pleasantly uh, about how many people wanted to um, participate in, in some shape or form. I wasn't sure whether there would just be half a dozen of us where we could all be on a video screen, but with the numbers of people that, that were interested, it felt that um, to have a meaningful um, exchange, would, it would have to be in some sort of webinar kind of format. But I would love some feedback uh, that as we go through, and I'll try and scan through all the, all the chats, but or later on by email, about what something useful might look like for you. So whether a, a weekly call, might be something that we could sort of establish some some regularity that you didn't always need to be into. Maybe it's just a one-off once every couple of months. Also, what more information uh, would be helpful or, or support for for you and your and your career and your and your families as much as much as I and we can help with that. Um, so anyway, here's question one, which I've separated into two two questions. I'm joining together. So. 
Um, this comes under the category of uh, being an artist, being a composer and having a career. And it's one of the reasons it's lovely to have Hannah with us as well, as well as Sagan. So the, the first form of the question uh, was from Johnny Colgan, who uh, part of his question was, what would be your advice to someone looking to establish themselves as a composer artist in their own right, alongside a career and with a desire to work in film and TV? So that's about the duality of being um, uh, both a recording artist and a composer. And also Catherine Hillier, as part of her questions uh, said, as a university graduate, how would you or anyone else give advice on gaining any unpaid or paid experience within the industry without looking overly keen. So really to group that together into a, a, a combination of how do you get started and what does that profile look like if you are both a, a do you start as an artist and start for a, as a composer, then um, I, I'll give you my experience and then maybe ask Hannah and Sagan to, to give theirs, um, which is that uh, I probably I had uh, maybe in some senses the, uh, the most old school experience. I was an assistant to a composer, Michael Kamen, for five years here in London and in LA. And then I uh, was a music editor for another five or six years on Lord of the Rings and Bridget Jones too and Love Actually. And so it wasn't for me until my mid thirties that I started doing more uh, solo composition myself in film and TV. Um, and then I uh, was also working with David Arnold. So we had that parallel thread that we still do now on Dracula and, and Sherlock. Um, it wasn't, wasn't until five or six years ago that I um, uh, signed with Erased Tapes to release my own material through them. So I think I'm someone who has um, kind of trained as a traditional film and TV composer and come up that way um, and then pivoted, if you like, certainly in the last 10 or five years through into be a recording artist being uh, kind of half of what I do. And I think the two inform each other very clearly um, to the extent where directors and filmmakers now are uh, not quite as likely, but uh, certainly within reason are likely to find my work through through albums as they are through uh, the film and telly if they're in a certain genre. Um, maybe particularly because Sagan uh, was taking a sip of his tea there. Then maybe Sagan, I could ask you uh, what that experience, experience was for you because you were at NFTS, is that right? Yeah, so I mean, I will probably leave a little bit more of the artist side to Hannah because I think she's sure. really, really well placed to answer it. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly in terms of um, I think for me, probably it's a little bit more to do with my outlook as a composer, which is one of having your own, very much having your own voice, um, but also being able to uh, move around depending on the style, the genre of film or anything. Um, and then if you look at an, you know, another group of composers would be someone like, uh, I'm trying to think of, oh, like, um, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, where it's a little bit more like they have a little bit more of a specific um, sound and, and through line, and then that's part of their overall musical careers. Yeah. Um, I personally think that for anyone who's interested in being an artist and also being a composer, I think it's probably almost the perfect time for that to be the case because there are so many examples of filmmakers either looking for someone who can do something slightly different um, but also understands how film and TV and storytelling works or just discovering people and then saying, well, I know you haven't done a film before, but actually can you come over and, and do my film? So for anyone who actually can do both and is interested in doing both, I think it's absolutely a great time to be working. Brilliant. That's great. And then uh, we're blessed to have Hannah Peel, the great Hannah Peel with us, uh, who I think would it be fair to say that you've come into scoring through the artist route. Yeah. Was that, was sure. that something you always had in mind? Do you know, um, when I graduated, I really wanted to write music for film and TV. Uh. And the only route at that point in time was 
for me, it was to maybe do a master's in film and TV. So I applied to a couple of places in London, went to a couple of auditions. I didn't get in. Um, I think the Royal College of Music, I don't know if they still do a master's in film and TV composition, but um, I didn't get in because my skills were more, mostly to do with production and MD work rather than actual classical scoring. And the guy who was running the course, the, a younger guy on it actually rang me and said, look, just keep going, just keep doing what you need to do, create your own sound and get people that way. And that was 10 years ago. And so I was like, right, well, I was a session musician at the time. So I decided to start writing my own songs, creating my own sound. And then I found the music box and made a cover of Tainted Love. <laughs> and um, then all is of a history. sudden, you know, <laughs> got it to the right people. There's a company in Manchester called Woodwork that plays a lot of music, do a lot of sync work. And then um, they placed it in like American Horror Story and quite a lot of TV shows. And that allowed Amazing. me to then start meeting supervisors and people and saying, here's my own albums. Um, yeah. This is my sound. And obviously it's changed a lot since making music boxes, but, um, I definitely think that it was, it allowed me to have a route and a little bit more of a presence when you're talking to directors and producers who at times just want to push you into a direction that maybe you're not willing to do or you don't want to do and you don't think fits with your artist. artist I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's more of an ego, but I think it's one. There's somebody that made a comment actually that this, there really shouldn't be a distinction anymore because I think oh, yeah. it's that sound that people buy into and, yeah. And the one thing I found is having records out there and things on Spotify is people um, find you easier and you've got a face and I think that's really worth it. And I think having that experience of making records anyway just gives you the quick experience because what I what I think everybody knows is that your deadlines are so quick. <laughs> you need to know your production skills and everything really fast and, and where to draw on and how to record really quickly. So. Does that help? <laughs> it really does. That's amazing insight. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the idea that... Um, uh, I was talking to somebody else about this the other, the other day. The idea of your personal story for, for everybody here is uh, such a fundamental part of the way that the filmmakers relate to you and how they explain you to someone else. Because by nature, uh, almost everybody working in film and TV likes telling stories. That's what we're all here for. And so if your own personal story isn't enticing or clear or focused or doesn't have an element of wonder in it, like who you are and what you do and why what you do is wonderful and magical and and that makes you a great asset to the show, then I think it it becomes harder and harder just to be employed as someone who is functionally very effective at putting music to picture. That that misses out the stardust of it. And I think the I think the stardust is very important. Um, moving on to question number two. It's like the world's worst geography lecture. Okay. Right. Uh, question two, this is from Octavia. Hi, Octavia. I saw you in the Q&A earlier. Sorry, I pointed out that you were in the wrong place, but you're very welcome. Um, and this is a question about challenge. Uh, did you ever face a challenge in your career that made you reconsider it or change career? Um, I think uh, this is the start of, I think, where we'll probably end up back, which is about... Um, uh, adversity, resilience, and general mental health and, and wellness. In fact, maybe we should just talk about wellness for the, for the whole time. Um, this is, uh, film and TV particularly, is, is not an area for the, um, for the faint of heart. Just because the process that is essential to uh, pulling together a multi-stranded object like a film or a TV show inherently has change and conflict sometimes built into it. It doesn't always have to, but sometimes that is just part of the, the wildlife in that particular jungle. 
And so, uh, as I've mentioned to a few friends before, I've been fired uh, quite publicly off, of, off quite a few things in my time. And every time that they, uh, that that happens, I kind of, um, uh, I, I do retreat slightly and kind of take a bit of a look to see um, whether I contributed to that situation or whether that situation was outside my control. And um, there's often a mixture of the two. If the bits that are within my control, is there anything um, that I feel I can, I can work on and change? Um, I can remember getting very cross with a director um, uh, who on a reasonably big film who definitely was just toying with me and, and trying to make my life a misery. And oh, certainly that's how I, how I experienced it. And, and in the end, because I did snap back, this is a very long time ago, then not only did I carry the sort of disappointment with myself about, uh, it, it, it didn't have a Hollywood ending. I got cross and, I just looked like an idiot and I should have just done the thing. The thing took five minutes once I'd calmed down a bit. Um, that sort of, the, the challenge feels like it is about developing enough long-term resilience that you're able to do the job when it's going well, when it's going badly, and you're able to provide good enough boundaries in your personal life so that if it's going badly, it doesn't tip over everything in, in your world at the, at the same time. Um, could, I, could I ask you guys to, to chip on that? Hannah, have you, has, has it all gone really well for you so far and you, you've faced no adversity? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's been insane. <laughs> I think because I'm at the stage where I'm, you know, I've not had a lot of experience doing a lot of, you know, I've done so many different things, you know, like the, even just doing radio presenting at the moment is a new thing. Um, last year I did three documentaries. I'd never done documentaries before and every single one of those had a challenge that I'd never experienced before and, and a, a way of working. And also one of the, the major things that I've found is you just get kind of straight into a production where everybody's known each other for quite a long time and then you have to settle into that and they have to settle with you. But it's, it's definitely had an effect on um, I would say mental health because yeah. I've had to sit in this chair for, I don't know, 14 hours a day since January, nonstop, no days off at all. Wow. And, and not seeing anyone, like I just wish I had a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want just to kind of go, hi, how are you doing? Compose the dogs of Instagram. <laughs> Surely there's, there's a whole new thing. <laughs> Definitely. But, um, I, you know, there's things I've learned that I would never do again. And I think getting an assistant and, and yeah. you know, the things that I wanted to ask you actually were just sure. like the roles of a music editor and how you deal with that and yeah. and what help can you get when you get to a certain stage that's not just working with a small budget anymore. Yeah. So. Actually, and it's a really good, uh, they're good questions, particularly for the, um, for, for those in the room that are at a certain level where they have, in fact, I think Sagan and I once talked about something similar walking back from the pub. They, there was, there's a certain level that you that you get to where where you begin to to get work and that and that's and that's very exciting. But then that the work and and the films and shows don't line up in a in a neat way. They almost always overlap. And then if they are going to do that, then you're in a position where either you you turn down the um, uh, turn down something which feels like a waste particularly when you're trying to get your your career going or you find yourself in a position where you try and you're having to try and expand your capacity to to produce music and uh i think over the years i've probably tried a, a various combinations of this which is um so at certain times i have worked with people writing additional music for me i i myself have written a lot of additional music uh, for other, other people over the years, some of which is on IMDb, some of which is deeply not on IMDb. <laughs> and the, so the, the concept of uh, having people to help, whether they're orchestrators or programmers or, or additional writers, is, is not 
a sort of a, an absolute moral no-no. It's just really difficult to, um, uh, to cleanly work with over an extended period of time because the people that you work with uh, inevitably change. If they're brilliant and talented and ambitious, then what is right for them on January the 1st one year is not right for them in the January the 1st the next year. Um, and that may or may not be appropriate in the situation that you're in with, with, the, with the show or with, with your team. And, and so if I've, if I've learned anything over the years, it's been about clarity of, of boundaries with the people that you're working with. So um, I tend to have the uncomfortable conversations first and then have the uncomfortable conversation again, just to make sure that we're all absolutely clear on, on, on what I'm expecting, what the production's expecting, what the role is. And unfortunately, I've never found a way to delineate those tasks so clearly that it doesn't take a certain amount of effort to manage that. So th the idea, you know, in, in my head, basically, I would get to sit in my chair between nine and six, have breakfast and dinner with my family, only work five days a week, and then mysterious elf stuff would happen around the back that would just <laughs> mean that the cue sheet got filled up damn so that's and, not real <laughs> and where are the elves bring on the elves <laughs> and and my my current experience is that i've actually slimmed down my uh the the people that i have here in the studio working with me so there's just just me and nick here um full time now and and we've sort of honed our systems to, to a, a level where there's very little faffing about with the sort of, with the practicalities of delivery or stemming or cue sheets. All of that is as automated as we, as we can make it so that the maximum amount of my time is spent writing and, uh, and, and we try and anticipate the delivery specs of the show's way in advance so that we try and remove all the all the pinch points and and then once you've made it as efficient and slick as possible it then just comes down to how many hours you want to spend in the chair and and i've got a young family and uh, i do not want to spend all my hours in the in the chair so um so i don't which is controversial i just go home <laughs> and and i i did a pickup job last week um the week before uh, for, for a, an episode of an American show that, that needed a replacement score. And um, because they had, they'd come to me and it was very, very, very last minute. They, um, I, I just said, I, I don't work weekends. I've got a three month old baby. Uh, so I'll send you something beautiful on Friday evening and let's talk about it again on Monday morning. And you say that with like a gulp in your throat, but do you know what? It was absolutely fine absolutely fine and wow. that doesn't always work but it, but it can and and i think it was in that instance about about boundaries mm -hmm. uh, second i'd love, love to hear your take on it because i know i know we had a half a conversation about it and i yeah. I, I wonder where you got to yeah I, I know we did i mean for me i like i've always been i don't know i grew up in a big family and i don't know if that kind of stayed with me but i've always been very much a kind of very family oriented person and um I read something interesting on a on a forum, an online forum about composing recently, where um, someone mentioned um, in response to a post, "Oh, it's really good to hear this particular person, this particular male, talking about having a family and how they work around um, their work balance and their family life." Because actually, often it isn't men who talk about it, and I found that really interesting because. I suddenly thought, well, that's actually quite true, but I don't see any reason why it should be. Because for me, from the moment that I wanted to like to do this when I was younger, the question was, how on earth does that work with also having a family? Yeah. Um, and so over the years, I've, I've um, spoken to a lot of people about it, and pretty much everyone responds in the same way. And they say that you have your studio at home, uh, and then you can nip in and have breakfast or dinner or 
and take the kids to school and then come back and do work or whatever it is it just means that you have that flexibility to be able to actually spend time with your family and also um, yeah. do all the work that you need to do um, and I think the fact that it's the route that most people take shows that it's it's tried and tested yeah. um, and in regards to the whole team thing I think that uh, if things go well in your work I think that there comes a point where you realize that to have the capacity to do certain jobs you need help it's just not it's not physically possible to do everything and that help could be that you have an orchestrator it could be that you have um, someone who's mixing for you it could be that you have an assistant um, it could be that you also have additional uh, writers and it just depends I think on personal preference as to what kind of structure that you go for and also your approach in terms of how you want to work on certain things so some people feel like oh, actually a good example would be michael um Giacchino, who's who in a number of interviews talks quite often about working you, you know quite normal hours like nine to six monday to friday not doing weekends and saying no to jobs whereas other people will talk about always saying yes and Kind of being in the studio all, all the time and that's each route is completely right for each different person and i think it's more about figuring out what's important to you and what you want to do um but i've personally found that pretty much everyone i've worked with has been totally cool with um family like being an important part of life so i don't know whether it's having an email with someone saying really sorry i can't get you feedback because I don't know, it's my wife's birthday or something, or it's my dad's 90th or something, um, or I, I, you know, I'm not working this weekend. Those are the kind of things that I've actually come across really often, and everyone seems to be really relaxed about it. And if I've said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm off on this particular day because it's my wife's birthday or our anniversary or something, everyone has been really, really cool and actually really supportive as well. So I think it's um, important to say that because I think that we tend to hear a lot about all the kind of eight months of like 20 hours a day kind of thing and I don't think that's quite how everyone's working so I think it's important that um, we kind of talk about all sides of that particular topic. I, th I think that's that's really thoughtful and and there there is a, a point to be made that um, there will there will be certain people that we'll all work with that if you if you say that you missed your mother's 75th birthday party to work on a queue will look at you as if you're a monster it's like <laughs> what were you doing go to the party you're a fool and a bad person for doing it <laughs> like you say it, it takes all sorts uh, now i think i'll probably take a, a quick a quick fire break now because uh obviously we're sort of making this up as as we all go along so i wondered if i whiz down the q and a's in, in a sort of like horrific quick fire two word answer to everything because as as much as uh as much as possible i'd love everyone to feel uh, heard even even in a small way uh so mary jess hi mary jess we're not in love very much um can we create a collaborators group yeah totally everybody who has replied yes that's exactly what we need to do mm -hmm. um so these are everybody's real names i <laughs> i imagine because everybody registered so I think it's a fairly safe space for people to be able to share details with each other. Uh, it's sort of a closed, closed group. Um, then uh, from Arsene, do you make hybrid records with few live, real live musicians? Uh, yes, pretty much everything we do these days. So all of Sherlock, all of Dracula, uh, a lot of Unforgotten, a lot of the films are hybrid these days. So um, Sherlock and Dracula, we usually record maybe 20 strings on top of uh, the samples uh, it makes a particular sound um, which is just is what it is doesn't sound like a real orchestra but can sound super expressive and cool Joe uh, do you think uh, when we've got many composers with work still to do and maybe with no work it might be beneficial for remote collaboration assisting between these composers uh, yeah I think we're gonna have to definitely all up our uh, remote communication game uh, I think, as I said earlier, for me, it feels like half tech, half um, half emotional, really, which is easily as much. Uh, and Helen has got a question about uh, computers 
that looks like there's uh, some experts, Jesper, etc., hopping on there. Um, one note about tech, yeah, I think it is obviously important to have a, um, uh, a functioning, efficient setup, but that is not the same as the, as the most modern setup or the most expensive setup. Um, and I think it, it emotionally becomes the thing that we just run to when we're feeling insecure about something else. Or oh, I'll get more work if I, if I buy the fanciest uh, gadget or the next Spitfire sample library of which the more out every day. Um, <laughs> just get something that works and stick with it, I, I say, surrounded by expensive things. Um, Amin says, I'm a composer from Iran. How I can get signed? Well, signing in film and TV uh, terms is a slightly different concept than, than in the record label, but it opens up the question about representation. So the, the two aspects to working in film and TV is one getting a job and the other getting somebody to represent you if you have got a job and the two often come sort of hand in hand in that it's very hard to get an agent until you're making enough money from your work that 15% of that money is worth them talking to you and that's fine it's not something to be sort of sad or angry about it's just the business side of it um, so for, for the majority of people, the, a publisher is the person that you should talk to before an agent, just because the, the gatekeeping is a little different. Um, and there are some very, very good publishers out there. Barney. Hello, Barney, sir. Uh, I don't understand the numbering system on individual pieces within big sessions. Sure, that one uh, is <laughs> about, about the uh, comedy cue numbers. Uh, people do it in slightly different ways. Um, the traditional way to do it is um, to think about reels of film so each reel of film will be up to 22 minutes in a uh, depending on the on the format and so you would see a cue that would be called 1m6 and that would be the sixth music cue in the first reel and then 2m and it would either be sequential so you'd have 2m7 or some people go back to the start at the reel and have 2m1 um, I do sequential, uh, so that I, I would do 2M7. And then for multi-episodic TV, um, a lot of people do something like uh, series 01 episodes, so S01, EP, 1 to 10, whatever it is, and then M something, because you're, you're trying to build into your systems the ability to create a unique identifier for every piece of music that if you're on a long running series um, over a number of years, that there might be thousands and thousands of pieces. Uh, but thank you for that, Barney. Da, 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 da. Also worth mentoring, mentioning you should put the, the name of the cut <laughs> in the title as well. Oh, no, no, super good point there. We're sort of assuming sometimes with some of these um, uh, systems uh, or, or it might look like we're assuming that the picture's not going to change. But as Sagan wisely points out, the picture always changes. Always. And, and so your, your sort of uh, cue sheet systems have to be essentially three-dimensional in that they have to be able to go sort of backwards in time to allow you to uh, still store information from past cuts and then update that to new, uh, to new information. Um, and this does tend to be where... Uh, people who have not got quite as much experience hit a bit of a wall in a production, if they're, particularly if they're doing telly, I think. Because if your first job is a multi-episodic TV show, then you're probably feeling good about the first couple of episodes. But then by the time sort of like episode seven of 10 comes in and then they're recutting everything under your feet and, you, and you're tired and run out of time. Um, yeah, those, those systems hopefully prop you up then. Second wryly and wisely smiles <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> that's right I, I just with two word answers for these uh, gregor says uh how do you manage your time between working for yourself and working for others um i tend to do uh the um there's a word for it a sort of big block approach so um i look at my diary for the year i know that there's going to be probably one or two big TV series blocks that are already in the diary. I then put big blocks in for myself. So that might be if I want to work on an album or if I want to do a project, I'll put a big block in and that's as important in my diary as the other stuff. 
because otherwise things just come in and fill. It's something to do with sand and pebbles, the analogy. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Paul, my good friend, Paul McLean. Well, I'd, I'd, I think this is about the face-to-face uh, -face versus um, collaboration online. And I think that's an incredibly salient point, actually. It might just be us old people who uh, are finding this transition difficult, which might um, uh, exaggerate a, a sort of a, a freshening up of the composer community, which is no bad thing. Um, Peter is generously offering music prep. Um, is IMDB super essential? Um, actually, yes, it is worthwhile keeping an eye on because people do refer to it because it's a trusted source. So um, it's really fiddly to update your uh, profile and credits on there. Some sort of historic system, very strange, but worth getting uh, to grips with it. If you check mine out, I have uh, got pictures on there and reasonably tidy and I've edited the biog. Um, so it's, it's worth doing because people do, do check it out. <laughs> Can you ask David Arnold for the 20 quid? No, not until he pays me back the 20 quid he already owes me. It's probably the same, <laughs> same 20 quid. Um, when, when do I get to heckle from Tom? Yeah, no, anytime. No, it's fine. Um, uh, also, I did an agent one. Solo piano music. Uh, do you recommend I get in, the, in touch with the label like erase tapes? Uh, no, is the short answer. Um, uh, I think the challenge is for all of us, if we're moving into a market where you don't necessarily know the people involved, all these labels, even the majors, are um, your relationships will be with individual people. And um, so the idea of sort of for any of us of sending something cold without having a conversation or without knowing really quite personally um, the, the people uh, who, who you, um, you might want to work with in the future is, is, is in my, uh, my experience, not the, not the best use of your time. It's probably better to try and get to know people. Maybe Hannah, can, can I ask you a little about uh, from, from the artist side, did, did you do a round of sort of like cold sending tracks round earlier on or was it was it about the people in your experience um well actually i've never been signed <laughs> hey, hey check you out i've always been on my own label and always self right. um there's been a couple of like collaborative projects that have gone out on different labels but small indies but mostly it's all been through my own label and using actually money from sinks to fund that um, That's but really it, inspiring. Well, it was a couple of reasons, but mostly master-wise, because you get to own my own masters, and that meant I could have quick responses to sync work, um, and I could choose when to put out singles if it was needed or if something was picked up, like, say, for example, Lauren Laverne on Six Music over here picked up something and it went to playlist, but it wasn't a single, so we just did a quick single release. <laughs> Um, and turned that around and I don't think that would have happened as fast if I'd have been on a label but also in, in the beginning a lot of people didn't get my music at all and didn't understand and I couldn't find the right family for that yeah. um, so I, I, I haven't actually been back to any labels since doing more stuff <laughs> so right. I don't know what the reaction would be but I, I, unfortunately when I was looking for a label I was met with a lot of um, we already have a female artist of this ilk on here. And, and that's, I don't like saying that, but that's exactly yep. what happened a couple yeah. of times by labels yeah. that we would know and probably quite admire. So <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't been back yeah. for a while. <laughs> Until now. No, that, I, I think that's incredibly valuable experience um, to share in terms of, I think there's probably still a, um, a, a sense that uh, certain gatekeepers, certain labels have, have got a, a cachet or um, uh, a, a marketing presence, and and that that can practically be be true. Um, but also, you know, someone like yourself has, has demonstrated you can do incredibly well without without being part of that system and, and find your own yeah. voice. And I, I think that's really important. I think there's so many ways at the moment that you can release music, especially Bandcamp, um, even just for night tracks. And actually. At, before the end, I'll put up the email address if anybody wants to send music in for Night Tracks on Radio 3 that um, we would 
find a lot of things sourced from Bandcamp, not necessarily Spotify albums that have been released. Um, a lot of the music played is, you know, beautiful recordings that people have put out themselves. And I think that's amazing. a really amazing tool because then you get played nationally and, and it doesn't really matter that you haven't got a label behind you. So I think there's something really worthwhile doing that. So I'll, I'll put that on once before we finish so people can take a copy of that. And if they think they've got music suitable for the show, send it in. That's totally fine. Super um, kind. But Brilliant. yeah, but, but funny enough, like I think a couple of labels now are starting to think outside the box because there's been so much press, which around everybody, you know, like just finding new music and things that people want to listen to and not necessarily yeah. always being pop focused. There's, um, there's a real want for things. So maybe they will find some more open doors with labels going forward. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm going to, uh, just because unbelievably, it's like eight minutes to go to the end of this. Um, I, th I think if, if anything, this has sort of demonstrated, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing in um, some, of the, uh, some of the comments, uh, can we um, do some more tech stuff? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I had a couple of nice questions uh, about um, compositional, actually sort of musical stuff rather than what sample library do you use? Uh, as well, which it feels like we, we should explore at, at a later date as well. And um, um, probably the one that maybe I'll just ask our panel to touch on uh, before we wrap up was a, was a question. Uh, so again, it's two questions that I've stuck into one. Uh, the first part from Michael Langley saying, I'd love to hear about any techniques used to maintain a level of creativity when deadlines lose and the right nights, the right notes just aren't coming. This is excellent. And then um, uh, I'm from Giles Thornton. Uh, how do you keep physically and mentally fit and healthy during busy periods of work? Um, I think we've touched on the, the why um, earlier on, but maybe uh, if I could get just a, a, a couple of thoughts from, from both of you on, on the how. Do you have any life hacks? Do you have any little tips and tricks for how, how you keep it all together when, uh, when things are getting tough? Sagan, maybe if I can come to you. Uh, that is a very good question. I think for me, I'm quite goal orientated. So I find it difficult. If I'm struggling with a cue, I find it difficult to leave it go and do something else and or like go and do another queue and then come back to it. I kind of have to, I have to tackle that queue and get it done. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I just have to keep going. And sometimes it's really brutal and it's really hard and it's really painful because it's not working. You know, it's not working. It's really frustrating, but those tend to be the cues that actually I'm like most happy with by the end, because it's been this great big struggle. And I finally figured out a way to make it work eventually whenever that happens. Um, so I would say kind of keep going, keep pushing through. Um, and in terms of uh, keeping, I don't know, keeping your like mental well-being, um, I found that um, when things get really crazy, it's really easy to basically drop anything and everything you can from life to the point where you're just eating and sleeping and working. And that's it. And I've kind of found that I'm not so keen on that. I mean, it's it's very difficult to do anything else when, especially if you're on something on a, a, a TV series in particular, where it's really intense and you've just got to keep going and you've got to write a very high number of music each day. Um, <clears throat> but I personally found that actually, if I keep working out every morning, I'm actually more productive during the day. So rather than losing rather than not working out and gaining a certain amount of time, I actually am not quite as productive during the day. So if I just spend that time working out, then when I get to work, I'm more focused throughout the day to keep going. And then I also take time off wherever I possibly can. So whether it's just Saturday evening, you know, chill out, watch a film, or whether it's, I can get, get to take the whole of Sunday off, wherever it falls and I can actually you know, I could do something else or I could actually just relax. Yeah. I'd actually rather just relax and, and refresh and then come back to work the next day or, or, you know, whenever it is I need to be back. You, sir, are a fitness inspiration to us all. And I, shall be, <laughs> I shall be at least walking home, maybe. <laughs> Hannah, how, 
Do, is there anything that you do? I mean, you, you mentioned that you've found this show, which I'm sure will be beautiful. You, you, felt, you found it quite a challenge mentally and physically just because of the hours. Was there, were there any things keeping you going? Yeah, do you know what? Amazingly, I moved to Northern Ireland like a, two years ago and I've um, lived right by the sea. So <laughs> the only thing, and if anyone follows me on Instagram, you'll know that every single picture is of the sea at kind of twilight. So I've worked through the whole day and the goal is to go by twilight, to go for a walk by the sea. And that's been the kind of only mental refresh I've had. I don't think this has been the best ideal working situation on this show at all, yeah. but I'm still learning. So, yeah. you know, I think there's, I'll find a better routine, but I think just exactly what Sigun was saying about having a, a mental refresh is really, really important. And even creatively sometimes that's just going from the computer and having to leave the computer behind mm. and going and sitting on the piano or mm. like, there's a violin just there and I'm, I've got a couple of pedals on the floor I just pick up the violin and play through pedals or something you know just to change your mindset not being stuck on something mm. um is normally works so right right um I'm gonna uh start to wrap things up now with my final piece of paper <laughs> so um uh certainly for me the, the time has absolutely flown and it feels like the, the sort of slightly the tip of the iceberg and and trying to find a format that works where as many of us can feel heard as possible but also there's a flow of information is is, is clearly a, a challenge but a worthwhile one um, so the first thing i'd ask is if you do have a moment to feed back to me maybe uh when everybody's had a moment or two just to think if you want to send an email uh, you can reply to the original invitation i think that comes back to my email address if you don't have it um if you have got a minute to follow uh myself hannah sagan and everybody else that you can see it's a good time to share um your twitter instagram uh, handles and, and kind of keep in touch because it feels like we should support each other as much as we can i see mary uh, jess has mentioned about a group uh, MJ, if you want to set up a Facebook group, uh, that'll be absolutely awesome. Invite me to it. I'll be, I'll be, love to be a part of that. Um, and in that feedback, uh, it doesn't need to be in any, any particular form, but if you could uh, suggest how, whether you want to do something like this again, if you do, how could it be better? Um, any suggestions gratefully received? Um, my suggestion for, for today, my takeaway is about digital empathy. This, this was an attempt to practice digital empathy uh, in the sense of to try and uh, get some of us together in, in some way or form to, to hopefully even just the act of participating um, means that we're experiencing a, a supportive community in, in as much as uh, one that's sometimes quite distant and split. So uh, I, I'm interested to hear about any, any other ways that you, that you find to practice digital empathy. Um, and my final point, as the, as the clock ticks round, like a really crap, bro I can't believe there's two broadcasters on the on the panel here who are used to like hitting the clock, and I'm just banging on. Um, but the uh, uh, last thought to everybody is is to stay well, uh, particularly uh, look after your neighbours and and the elderly um, and people who are particularly vulnerable at the moment in in your life. Um, so thanks very much to Hannah and to Sagan. For thank you michael yeah. <laughs> you're amazing thank you <laughs> that's very very kind um and so i'm gonna end the meeting here but yeah do keep the communication open send me emails and uh hope to see everybody again soon thanks very much bye-bye